Hello and welcome into the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. Really fired up about the episode we have coming your way today. Hope everyone's start to the week has been great. It feels like the first official week for Kansas football. I don't know. FCS opponents, Lindenwood, feels a little bit more like a preseason game than a real season game. And look, the real season really feels like it's here for KU as the Jayhawks head to Champaign, Illinois, later this week to take on the Fighting Illini. Today, you'll be able to hear from Jeremy Warner, who covers Illinois for 24-7 Sports. He does a great job with all of their Illinois coverage. He's obviously got a couple of our staff members there that do some great work. So really excited for you guys to hear our conversation. We hit on a lot of different topics, ranging from just the Illinois program to um, all both sides of the ball and the way last season went for Illinois and what this season looks like ahead. As for the Jayhawks, you know, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. We've already heard from Lance Leipold, from both of KU's coordinators and a few players. Um, starting with, I think, Lance Leipold, a few notes. Obviously, he has a great relationship with Brett Bielma, the head coach at Illinois. They have a relationship dating back to Bielma's time at Wisconsin um, when obviously Leipold was at Wisconsin Whitewater. Bielma was at uh, Wisconsin at the time. They crossed paths a little bit there. Then when Leipold was hired at Buffalo, um, Bielma, who was then coaching in Arkansas, asked for Leipold to come down and just spend a day around the Arkansas program during bowl prep. It's some, a, a deal an agreement, something that Leipold cites is helping him a lot, especially as he transitioned from being at Wisconsin and Whitewater to then going to a group of five program in Buffalo. As for the game this week, look, I think everyone around KU is talking about how physical this game is going to be. You know, Illinois being a Big Ten opponent, they're going to want to play physical. They're going to want to play downhill. And for KU, it's going to be about managing that physicality and using some of your own advantages on the field. And I think hearing, you know, someone like Jeff Grimes talk this week, I think he is very aware of the challenge that Illinois can pose with the way their defense is schemed, where it's kind of like a five-man front, and then they have a linebacker and then defensive backs. So it makes it a little bit different, where for KU and Brian Borland, it's the talk about, hey, you know, they've got some new offensive linemen. How is this defensive front and this front seven going to be able to manage that? And so that all remains to be seen as for the betting spread for this week, Really interesting. On Sunday, you started to see some of the Lions open up at about six, six and a half for KU. Circa Sports in Las Vegas, they announced their line at KU minus three, which is a huge difference. You really don't see that very often, and that really, really was a point of interest for me. I'm just very fascinated by betting spreads generally, and I thought that was really interesting to see the discrepancy between those two. Now, in the time since, the line's gone down to about five, five and a half, depending on where you're looking, and really interested to see how that spread changes throughout the course of this week. We'll have another podcast later this week with a deeper preview. We'll also talk about some recruiting stuff going on for KU basketball this weekend. Um, but without further ado, let's jump into this interview with Jeremy Warner. All right, we are joined now by Jeremy Warner, our Illinois beat writer for IlliniInquire.com. Jeremy does a great job covering all things Illinois. Make sure you're checking out his website over the course of the week to get all sorts of Illinois coverage from that side of things. But we'll get some of Jeremy's thoughts here on all things Illinois and this matchup with Kansas. Jeremy, let's start off. How's the start of your week been? We're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. I hear you guys have done at least a little bit of media, but how's the start of the week been for you guys? It's been good, man. Uh, this is kind of a, I don't want to say a make or break game for Illinois because that's crazy. Week two, there's uh, 12 games in a season. But for this Illinois fan base that was so excited about last year and then what happened in Lawrence last year really put a damper on things. And it kind of was a sign of things to come because they went two and four to start the season. And they got back on track but ultimately fell short of a bowl as they lost their last couple games by two points. Had a really tough game against Wisconsin where Johnny Newton got – toss for targeting so just things did not go the way they were supposed yeah. to go last year after what was a, a breakthrough eight win season in 2022 so this game is kind of like for illinois fans like okay prove it to me prove to me why i should be excited mm -hmm. uh, about illinois football in, in 2024 because there's no question brett bielma has improved this program like kansas when he took over um 
Illinois was one of the worst power five programs, right? Just, and it wasn't just like they lost games. It was just, they got crushed, right? Like just consistently losing by 20 points in conference games. So Illinois and Kansas had that similarly. And Brett Bielma and Lance Leipold from everything I gathered at the time were Illinois two top candidates. And they wanted Brett Bielma at the end of the day. And Lance Leipold was a heck of a hire for Kansas. But you see Leipold turn from a bowl appearance to a nine win season. Now, the Big 12 is a little bit different than the Big 10. There, there might be a more opportunities for wins, right? But at the same time, like that would be like last year would be a like Kansas if they fell to like a five win season this year. That That's kind of mm-hmm. how it felt. Um, so even though Brett Bielma has certainly lifted this program to where it's way more competitive, uh, yeah. last year was a disappointment. So this, this kind of re, retooling of the roster and now a, a new you know team, it's really interesting because Illini fans, they're about to sell this thing out. Illinois hasn't had a sellout since 2016. So that tells you there's some excitement with the Illinois fan base about the possibility of what Saturday could be. Of course, Kansas is a very good team with a great offense, uh, testing a defense that um, we have huge questions about heading into Saturday Mm -hmm. night. Well, you hit on the biggest thing I want to hit on, at least the beginning part here, is just the mood around, I think, the season overall. I obviously kept track of Illinois last year after KU beat them to see how things went. I, you know, you summed up great. Like a lot of one score games that if things go differently, it's a different season and it feels different. What is the f- vibe, I guess, for you, for you going into this season? Like, what are you expecting from this Illinois team? We'll dive into some of the, the newcomers, yeah. right? New faces, all of that. But just broadly, like, what are your own expectations for Illinois this season? I think one thing, Illinois football was pretty confident coming out of 2022 and their ability to develop talent because mm. what they did with a no-star recruit in Devin Witherspoon, what they did with Sidney Brown and Quan Martin, guys who were underrated, right, and turned into second- and third-round draft picks. So they didn't maybe attack the portal as much as they should have in, in addressing some of those needs, and that really got exposed against Kansas with their lack of speed, their lack of just overall experience. I mean, it was a green team, a lot of – first time starters going up against Jalen Daniels and Devin Neal and uh, all these guys. So uh, that was a wake up call for them, but they also had a first time defensive coordinator and Aaron Henry, Ryan Walters, who's not a Purdue head coach was an unbelievable defense coordinator. Uh, just the mentality he brought, the way he just, you know, deployed his talent was really, really good. And, and Aaron has never called plays before. So this week mm-hmm. he's talked about how last year was a big learning moment for him and things had gone pretty well. He was a, defensive coordinator at age 34, right? Like he was, uh, had just had twin girls before the season started, um, making a lot of money and uh, had a pretty good, you know, first game in the bowl game as a defensive coordinator a year ago, but it was just kind of a, an awakening last year. But this season, I think there's confidence in the offense because mm-hmm. Luke Altmeyer was a, a pretty good playmaker in his first year as a starter, was near the top of a lot of categories in the Big Ten as, as a quarterback. Uh, Caden Fagan, now a sophomore, uh, late in the season, for people that don't know, 6'3", 250, uh, but he's really explosive as well as powerful. He was a big recruiting win, a four-star in-state prospect. Uh, and he looked really good at the end of the season and really helped them turn around and be more balanced offense. And they got hurt the final two games. They lost the final two games. So uh, that had a big instance. But they also attacked the portal really well. They've added two offensive tackles that could be NFL players via the transfer portal and J.C. Davis mm-hmm. and Melvin Priestley. The one guy, Zachary Franklin, who's the NCAA's active receiving yards leader uh, and had a lot of success for Barry Loney. So there's a lot of optimism about the offense, uh, taking another step forward in year three under Barry Loney Jr. The big questions are on defense. Uh, your defense wasn't good last year. took a huge step back. You have the same coordinator. And you lost Johnny Newton, who was one of the best defenders in Illinois history. And despite Illinois being terrible defensively last year, Johnny Newton left his mark in Lawrence, right? Like he he was dominant in that game, but it was all him. So they did go into the portal and got a couple cornerbacks. Torrey Cox Jr. out of Ohio started last week, which is a little bit of a surprise. Uh, Four-star Texas transfer, who Kansas fans might know a little bit about, Terrence Brooks, surprisingly did not start. Um, He was a huge addition for them. Uh, won uh, that battle over Michigan and USC, and he didn't start. So they haven't seen quite enough from him. But um, they did show some differences defensively that I thought was interesting, but they're a lot more experienced on that side of the ball. But uh, I think there's optimism offensively, but you got to have 
much improved defense to, to make a bowl game, especially in the Big Ten and the schedule that Illinois has, having Kansas in the non-conference. They have four games against ranked opponents, three against mm. top ten opponents. So their defense has to take a big step forward, and that's why this week is, is so intriguing because we're going to learn a lot more about them. So I want to dive in a little bit of some of the newcomers then, because obviously, like you mentioned, right, like someone have, you have Johnny Newton, Keith Randolph, like they're really good defensive linemen. And you lose those two guys, you return you know, Seth Coleman, Gabe Jackis, like guys that are really good. I thought had decent games last year in Lawrence on, on defense. How did they attack the portal? Was it going after like the high caliber guys that you're having to put NIL funds into? Is it getting some guys that are from like the Mac? Cause that's what Kansas has done, you know, with their defensive transfers. It's been guys like Lonnie Phillips from the Mac, you know, someone like Dylan Woodkey from Youngstown state, you know, how did they attack trying to replace some of those guys on the defensive front and just generally like walk us through some of those newcomers, right, on defense and maybe what you're kind of looking for to see from them in a, in a game like this? It's interesting how Illinois and Kansas overlap a lot in football <laughs> uh, because, yes, that was Illinois' approach. You got to go find the under recruited guys, you got to kind of mm -hmm. go find the under the radar guys because your NIL might not be as up to par. I want to change that a little bit this offseason. They, they raised a lot of NIL, and, and you saw it with being able to get Zachary Franklin, Terrence Brooks. Dennis Briggs Jr. is a seventh-year defensive lineman out of Florida State uh, that was part of a rotation for a team that won 13 games last year. Obviously not a good start this year. But um, he's he's a very stout 6'3", 6'4", 280 pounds, plays that Keith Randolph Jr. kind of role where – I don't know if he's going to be the flashiest guy, but he's stout and, and he can uh, get some pressures and really take on a lot of double teams. He's 24 years old. He has kids, right? He's a, he's a grown man. He's a former four-star prospect and he uh, probably could have been a starter. He just had a lot of injuries um, at, at mm -hmm. Florida state, but he's been healthy. So that's been a big addition to them up front. Uh, Terrence Brooks, they added, they had a couple more transfer defensive linemen uh, that really aren't making, probably won't be a huge part of, of the rotation on Saturday night, but the biggest thing for them, I, I thought from potentially the opener is Gabe Backus moved a little bit. Like he, he's an outside linebacker, but he's six, three, two seventy five. So he's built more like a Johnny Newton type of a player. He's more of a power player than a quickness guy, but then he went inside and played the four eye technique and played the three technique on passing downs. So that allowed them, because Illinois is deeper at outside linebacker, they have more talented outside linebacker. They got two guys in, in Alec Bryant and freshman Joe Barna, who they think can be really good players this year mm -hmm. in the Big Ten. Um, so that allows Gabe them to put their best 11 on the field. And Gabe, he's not the best edge rusher because he doesn't have as much bend or you know quick burst. But on the interior, he's pretty quick. Uh, yeah. He's got some of that quickness. So it kind of lets him exploit some matchups, get him in some one-on-one -on -one matchups. So I found that really interesting. And then on the back end, last year, Dylan Rosiak, I think it was his first or second start at linebacker last year, going up against Devin Neal. And, and Andy Kotelnicki did a heck of a job of exploiting Illinois' lack of speed at linebacker. Mm -hmm. But Rosiak had a really good year after that. Um, he really forces a lot of fumbles. But he's one of many guys who's kind of a second-year starter now. He's been through the, the growing pains. Um, Tyler Strain, their nickelback. Uh, Xavier Scott, their corner. Um, Miles Scott, their free safety, had two takeaways last weekend. So I expect that group to get better just because of their experience. Hmm. They're not the most athletic, fast group, which is what my concern would be against Kansas, but they are a smart, physical group. And Matthew Bailey is another name to know. He didn't play last year, most of last year, due to a shoulder injury, and he didn't play against Kansas. I think he's going to make a huge impact because he's 6'2", 210, kind of like Marvin Grant for Kansas. Yeah. Packs a punch in the running game, can line up on tight ends. This kind of gives you some, some versatility that they, I think they're really going to need because Kansas, obviously, I think is going to try to exploit Illinois sideline to sideline and get Devin Neal some open lanes. And potentially to take those outside linebackers out of the game, which is a strength for Illinois, you know, Jalen Daniels got to worry about containing him. Well, that opens things up for Devin Neal. And I think that's why the linebackers and the strong safety, Matthew Baylor, are going to make a big impact. Yeah, and I guess you maybe even hit on this a little bit there. Have there been many changes defensively with the scheme now heading into a second year, right, with Aaron Henry? Something Leipold talked a little bit about when he got to talk to him on Monday was 
the fact that Bielma has been very consistent over the years with what he does, it's not a lot of like, okay, that didn't work last year. We're changing this now. It's much more like the process driven that we hear Leipold talk um, endlessly about. So I guess, how did Illinois approach that defensively? Maybe hit on one of the tweaks there that they did with Gabe. Yeah, Gabe moving on the inside would be one of those. Uh, I just think the biggest thing about them is they kind of do what they do. They're, they're a three-man uh, front, but it's really like a five-man front, three defensive linemen, uh, and two outside linebackers. They only play one linebacker, mostly, with five defensive backs, right? That's kind of this 5-1-5 five, five that uh, I think a lot of people are going to with these spread offenses. Mm -hmm. uh, but in college, there's so many good rushing attacks, you got to kind of go against that. But I think it's more – I think they're going to get their best 11 on the field. I think last year they didn't do that at mm -hmm. all times. Uh, and this year I think with Gay back is maybe playing a little bit more defensive lineman, makes them a little bit more athletic uh, up front. Uh, but the biggest thing I just think is experience in the scheme. Last year, you know, two years ago, they ran almost completely man all the time. And you can do that when you have Devin Witherspoon and Sidney Brown and Quan Martin uh, and some of the guys they had. Last year, they tried to do that against Kansas, and they just got exposed. Uh, they just completely exposed because they don't even have that talent anymore. Yeah. So I'm interested to see this week because, I mean, you don't learn much against an FCS opponent. Illinois ran some cover two, some, a lot of man. But uh, I think Illinois still wants to run man if they can uh, and, and mix that in with some zone. But uh, I do think we saw Aaron Henry be a little bit more aggressive because he can trust his defensive backfield a little bit more than they did last year. Because that was the hallmark of Ryan Walters, man. He would play man-to-man, -man, press coverage with a single high safety. You'll see him, Miles Scott, lined up 20 yards off the ball, playing center field, basically reading the quarterback, uh, and then just get after it uh, in the blitz game. So he'd force your quarterbacks to be under duress uh, and, and force them to throw into tight windows, which I think is usually a good plan. Now against Jalen Daniels with a green secondary last year, it didn't work. Um, so that, that's what's going to be interesting to see how much more that secondary has improved because I think Kansas tries to get the ball out quickly, and, and we'll see if uh, mm -hmm. Illinois can you know, stand up a little bit better than they did last year. Yeah, I got to give Brett Bielma credit. He was citing some of the time out, you know, how quickly Jalen Daniels is throwing the ball, right? Less than two seconds uh, a lot of the time, which is huge for KU, and obviously Jalen has the ability to extend plays as well. But let's switch to Illinois' offense. You know, I think last year – you know, KU spent a lot of time really working on their defensive line last year. And I think the Illinois game was a good showing for that group. I don't think, you know, the offensive line for Illinois was able to do as much as they maybe would have liked. What does that unit look like now? I obviously I watched some of the, you know, Eastern Illinois game, two new tackles I thought looked really good, uh, especially just off the hoof in that game. But talk to us a little bit about how that offensive line, maybe reconstruction has gone this off season. Yeah, if you see the helmet in the background, I'm a Bears fan, so I'm now a huge fan of Austin Booker. And it was kind of his breakout party, it felt like, last year yeah, against bit. Illinois. Um, he had two sacks, I believe, in, in that game. And, uh, you know, that forced Illinois to change their offensive line. Like, they went in thinking their offensive line would be really good because they had mm. two NFL guys on the left side. But right tackle, Zach Chrysler got so exposed that they had to move Adams out to right tackle. And, and the offensive line just took a whole, like, month to really get settled in. So they attacked that position more than any in the portal. They went and got J.C. Davis, New Mexico transfer, who I think 24-7 sports had as a top five offensive tackle prospect. They really got him before I think everyone else kind of found out about him. He was one of the best pass blockers in the uh, group of five last year, mm. and he was dominant in the first game, again, against, against an FCS opponent. But they think he could be their best NFL draft prospect. So um, he's a really good pass protector, pretty good run blocker. But the surprise has been Melvin Priestley, a kid out of East St. Louis, went to Grambling State, uh, has a really inspiring story. But uh, he's just a physical, uh, really athletic right tackle who was awesome in his first game. Again, caveat, bad opponent. He's got a much bigger opponent. And going against Jerome Robinson is going to be a little bit different. But um, I, I, he's their tackles have been really encouraging. And Josh Kruitz, the son of Owen Kruitz, who's a uh, former Bears great, uh, he returns for a second season. Josh Geske at left guard returns for his second season. Those guys have improved a lot. My big question is about Zy Chrysler at right guard. He moved back to guard last year and was solid, but he's getting pushed by a couple other guys. But their offensive line, they addressed in the portal, and they now feel like they have two or three guys – on their two deep that they feel comfortable playing. Mm -hmm. That was not the case last year. Um, and, and then obviously Austin Booker pr pretty much ended their experiment of Chrysler at right tackle. So that, that forced their offensive line that we thought was going to be a strength and it turned into a weakness for most of last year. 
Um, I, I think it's a real strength for this group, which obviously opens up a lot of things for Luke Altmaier, Caden Fagan, and a group of skill play, playmakers that I, I'm pretty encouraged about. And so you probably hit on this at the very beginning, but just to wrap up here, then, you know, you talked about it almost being a sellout and I'm sure by the time we get to, to Friday or Saturday, it will be, I think the Alma said a thousand seats were left as of Monday. You know, you read that and think, all right, this one's going to be sold out just generally. Like, what does this game mean for Illinois? You know, I wrote about this for your subscribers, Jeremy, like for KU, this is kind of the litmus test. Are you yeah. as good as I think a lot of people think you are? Right? Can you go compete for Big 12 title? If you can, you are able to go on the road and deal with the physicality of Illinois and win the game. For Illinois, though, like what does this game mean? What's kind of on the line for them on Saturday? Well, it's surely a litmus test, right? That's part of what you scheduled this game 10 years ago for, is, is to prove yourself. Now, I think both these programs thought the other program would be worse than it is right now, especially Illinois, when, when they scheduled this. But I think it's a great litmus test for Luke Altmyer. Has he gotten that much better? Um, because he's got a couple of good receivers and Pat Bryan, who's 6'3, 215, had two touchdowns in the first game. Sakari Franklin, Malik Elzey is a former four star prospect. Like, this is a good, this is the best group of wide receivers I probably covered at Illinois. Um, but they're going up against the one of the best groups of DBs they'll be going up against all year. So I'm fascinated to see how Altmeyer and these receivers do against. Kobe Bryant and, and Melo Dotson and you know, OJ Burroughs. Like this, this is a great secondary they're going up against. So that's great. Uh, Kansas does have questions in the trenches. I feel like Illinois is the stronger team on paper in the trenches, but they got to show it. The offensive line that's kind of new, they haven't played a power five opponent yet. Defensive line that's new, like they have to prove it. So um, I do think – what concerns me most is is Devin Neal. <laughs> uh, Jalen Daniels is a heck of a quarterback, but Devin Neal's speed uh, is a huge test for the defense. But so it's a big litmus test for everybody on this team, the the c- coaching staff, the the players, just to show that this year is different. This is a clear. Bielma makes a huge deal about matchup rematches uh, from a year prior, and this is the first one on the schedule. And if there's a clear one that you want to show you're way better than, it's Kansas, where you went down thirty four to seven. Last year, I mean, the score, the end score of that game was not indicative of how you know big of a blowout that was. Um, but also, Illinois has a really tough schedule after Kansas. They got Central Michigan next week, and they should win that one. But then they go at Nebraska and at Penn State. Okay, and then next month, before Halloween, you have a game against number ten Michigan and number seven Oregon at number seven Oregon. So. <laughs> You need to get one of these games against Kansas or Nebraska and probably need to get the Purdue game to not have just like three, like two or three wins going into November. Now, November, it's a bunch of toss up games. It's a really advantageous schedule, but it is so front loaded of how tough this schedule is with Kansas at Nebraska at Penn State. Illinois does not beat Purdue very often. Uh, They should, but they don't. And then you got Michigan and Oregon. So uh, there's another reason there's a lot on this game because. If Illinois wins this, I think there's a real path to getting the four or five wins before November and really having a good season and feeling like you can, you know, get back to a seven, eight win team. But if you lose this one, the path to a bowl gets gets really, really difficult because of the schedule and because as a program like Illinois, you worry about depth in November, right? Like all these other teams might have a bunch of four-star prospects, Illinois and, you know, the Minnesotas of the world, Rutgers, Northwest, like you might not have as many of those guys. So that's, mm-hmm. that's what you get concerned about. So just where that is at in the schedule and what happened last year. Uh, I think this is, I wrote a, a top five pivotal games. I think this is the most pivotal game mm-hmm. of the season, even though it's week two, doesn't mean they can't get to a bowl game if they lose this one, but you at least want to show like, can you compete? Can you can you get into the fourth quarter, have a chance to win, and then whatever team wins on the margin wins the game. So uh, I'm fascinated. It's going to be, I, I think, a huge test for for Illinois. Hearing Oregon as like a that's a conference foe for Illinois. That's just so weird. I, I'm just, it's going to take me a long time to get over that. Just like for KU, it's like oh, you last year like you know you play UCF and all these. Teams. That's just so weird. Awesome, Jeremy. Well, thanks a bunch. Hey, plug your stuff. Where can folks find you? Um, give them everything they need to know. Yeah, just go to IlliniInquire.com. Uh, you can find us there uh, at jwarner247. Uh, but uh, I'm a huge fan of Lance Leipold and, and what he's doing. Uh, he was number one target on my board. I didn't know Brett Bielma would be involved in this until uh, a couple of days before he got hired. But uh, what he's done and what his staff has done is has been uh, fantastic. So I'm, I'm really interested to see 
uh, if they can make noise in the Big 12 this year. Yeah, me as well. Well, thanks a bunch, Jeremy. We'll see you this weekend. All right, I want to thank Jeremy again for taking time to talk with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. I thought it's some really interesting stuff from him. Um, as always, thank you for listening to the Fog.net podcast. If you like what you heard, please leave a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, please make sure you're liking the video, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment. All that stuff goes a really long way in helping us reach new Kansas fans, and that's what we're all about here, trying to get as much Kansas content to Kansas fans as we possibly can. So thanks as always for listening to the Fog.net podcast. We will talk to you all again later this week.